Welcome back, everyone. Now, in part one, we talked about the wellness field in an overall sense, and we explored the roots and origins for coaching. In part two, we're going to expand upon that by talking about the different ways that wellness coaches work. So this section is titled Being a Wellness Coach, and we will explore learning that's related to both one-on-one -on -one coaching and corporate wellness coaching. As part of this lesson, we encourage all coaches to do a self-assessment of your knowledge, skills, and abilities, and we've provided some screens for this in the written portion of your materials. We'll also talk a little bit about items to consider as you move forward with marketing your skills as a wellness coach. Now, in its simplest form, wellness coaches help people to improve their health and their well-being using personalized coaching skills. Usually, clients come to a wellness coach because they're struggling with something that might be blocking their well-being, and this could include stress, weight loss, life balance, or even just their energy level. Coaches help people overcome the struggle of recapturing their health and their well-being. They also build skills such as self-motivation, self-awareness, confidence, and resilience in the client. And most importantly, wellness coaches are distinguished from other coaches because they help clients that make changes that are sustainable. Oftentimes, people have tried a lot of different quick fixes and they find that they don't stick or they don't work. Wellness coaches are skilled at getting people to a place where it sticks, where their new lifestyles become embedded into who they are. The wellness coaching field is new and the qualifications and training standards for wellness coaches as well as the distinction between wellness coaches and health coaches is constantly being evaluated for its effectiveness and there's a strong case to be made for national standards which are well underway. In part one we talked about the wellness field overall. Now in part two we're going to expand upon that by talking about the different ways that wellness coaches work. This section is titled being a wellness coach and we will explore learning related to both one-on-one -on -one coaching and corporate wellness coaching. During this lesson, we also encourage you to do a self-assessment of your knowledge, skills, and abilities, and have provided screens for this in the written portion of your material. Lastly, we'll talk a little bit more about items to consider as you move forward with marketing your skills as a wellness coach. Now, in its simplest form, wellness coaches help people to improve their health and their well-being, and they use personalized coaching skills to do this. Usually, people come to a wellness coach because they're struggling with something that's blocking their well-being, and this can include stress, weight loss, life balance, or even energy levels. So coaches help clients overcome the struggle of recapturing their health and wellness and their well-being, but they also build skills into the relationship, such as self-motivation, self-awareness, confidence, and resilience. Most importantly, wellness coaches are distinguished from other types of coaches because they help clients make changes that are sustainable. Oftentimes, clients have already tried a lot of different quick fixes and find that they haven't stuck. Wellness coaches are skilled at getting clients to a place where behaviors stick and it becomes part of a new lifestyle embedded into who they are. Since the wellness field is new and the qualifications and training standards for wellness coaches are always being evaluated for effectiveness, there's a strong case to be made for national standards, and this is really where we are today. So part two will be more about describing a little bit more detail on how it is to be a wellness coach. And when you're done with this particular lesson or section, you will be able to describe the dynamics of the one-on-one -on -one coaching model and to describe the differences between coaching models in use today. You'll also know how to perform a personal assessment of your current knowledge, skills, and abilities. And lastly, you'll be able to brainstorm some creative ways that you can market your skills as a wellness coach. Now, many are predicting this sort of financial crisis that's based around the health care and the needs of baby boomers. With 70% of health care costs being related to preventable disease, each and every one of us has this sort of responsibility to do our part to take good care of our health and our wellness. And if we don't do it collectively, it's going to become extremely expensive for both the individuals as well as our society overall. So people are awakening to realize that pharmaceutical companies aren't going to cure being overweight or diabetes anytime soon. And what remains is to work on improving our lifestyles each day. So we're saying to ourselves, it's up to me, and how am I going to do this? And who's going to pay for my health care in the future? So these are important decisions that people face and want to take action on. Some will look for a wellness coach to give them guidance on this journey.
Currently, there are a few small-scale experiments where we see reimbursement for the services of a wellness or health coach, but they're really too new and hit or miss to be able to decide if they're effective. So you might be seeking to earn your wellness coach credential to enhance your current business model as a coach, or you might be branching out into a new field altogether. Many employers, health plans, and hospitals employ wellness coaches to work on site through vendors to enable access to their services by the employees, and this would be a corporate wellness model. Physicians are starting to employ health and wellness coaches to work with their patients who have chronic diseases related to unhealthy lifestyles. So you will have options, and within these options, there are different characteristics that may help you determine which type of coaching style you'd like to use. For example, if you're coaching individuals one-on-one -on -one and face-to-face, -face, you will most likely need to go out and cultivate a client base. But if you're working for a company or a corporation, you will have a client base of employees to work as a wellness coach to serve right away. The coaching styles that you use will be those that best match the needs of your client, and therefore behavior change models will need to be understood. So your specialty may depend on your background. So you might approach wellness with clients differently if you have a background in exercise physiology or, by comparison, psychology. Regardless, your delivery model toward the goal of changing behaviors should always be the same with each client. Because of the wide scope of topics that make up the wellness field, there's most likely going to be a need for you to access some external resources to learn concepts that might not be known to you, at least for now. And as an example, if you're a personal trainer, you may not have very strong skills tied to behavior change coaching because you typically rely on your knowledge of exercise physiology or nutrition to be able to coach your client after all of your assessments have been done. If you're a licensed social worker, on the other hand, You'll need to learn more of the exercise sciences because it may not be your field of study. But, like all wellness programs delivered to our client, your knowledge, skills, and abilities are always going to be about balance. Wellness is becoming big business. Major corporations such as Nike and Coca-Cola employ wellness coaches. Smaller companies are now doing this too. Many coaches plan to eventually build a private practice and this will rely on the work of wellness coaching becoming more widely understood and accepted. Other coaches will combine wellness coaching services with other work that they do already, such as speaking, writing, group classes, therapy, personal training, or any other careers that might be outside of the health industry. Based on surveys from hundreds of coaches in many settings, newer wellness coaches typically earn from $25 on the low end per coaching hour, but can easily work up into the $50,000 to $100,000 range per year, depending on the setting. So there are some benefits to being a wellness coach. It happens to be a very fulfilling job, and there's a fair amount of flexibility. You'll be able to decide or determine if you want to do online coaching, face-to-face -face consults, or if you'd like to communicate using other forms of technology, such as Skype or FaceTime. The work you do as a coach will depend on the path that you choose. So in terms of income, this will largely be determined by your experience and your geographic location. And right now, sessions for wellness coaches average around $50 per hour, but can go as high as $150 in some larger cities. But the satisfaction that the coach gets once they experience the feeling of truly helping someone to reach their wellness goals becomes very powerful for the coach. During this time, strong bonds and relationships are formed as part of the coaching process as well. And we have to acknowledge that there is value in that. When a wellness coach works one-on-one -on -one with their client, each individual client will view you as their own personal practitioner of wellness. And during the entire course of your coaching relationship, this will shape your relationship with your client. This includes developing trusting relationships for sustained engagement in the coaching process, so it's vital to get this right. It should be clear that really anyone could use a wellness coach at one point in time. And we've already talked about what clients look for in a coach and that was covered in lesson one. Since it has an influence on how you would work as a wellness coach, let's talk a little bit more about those who seek out a wellness coach. We probably don't need to tell you this, but really anyone could. Wellness coaching helps clients define goals that are important to them, and then uses science-based strategies to achieve these goals. And the purpose of wellness coaching is to help clients to explore their own desires, ability, reasons, 
and the needs for making change in their lives, and then to take action to make and sustain these changes. It is well established that sustained change comes from within the person. All change is really self-change. Imposing solutions on people may deliver some temporary benefit for them, but sustained change won't happen unless the person owns the process of the change effort. So rather than teaching, advising, directing, or prescribing what another person should do, wellness coaches act as the guide to help the client forge their own unique path toward greater well-being. This is done through empathetic conversation and employing science-based tools and techniques to support the self-change process. What's interesting is that most clients aren't really aware of all of this that's going on to help them make a change, yet they still represent the typical person or client who could benefit from retaining a wellness coach. In an official sense, the objective of this certification is to provide what we call a minimum standard and measure of foundational competencies, the knowledge, tasks, and skills essential to the practice of health and wellness coaching. Coaching guidelines are useful to guide coaches in either a one-on-one -on -one format or in group settings. There are some key proficiencies that have to be mastered by wellness coaches. Knowing these guidelines will help you see the challenges before the coach to be more effective and successful with a variety of circumstances and clients, especially when we consider all of the diversity that clients bring to the coaching relationship. Some coach training can include what we call doing or being skills. Try to think of what coaching actions you would do as we continue. Essentially, there are three core coaching skills consistently found across different learning platforms and therefore form the basis for developing a coaching relationship with a client. Mindful listening is probably the most important of all coaching skills. Listening that brings full, non-judgmental awareness of what someone is saying in the present moment is a cornerstone of a great coach. It is a positive step when clients come to feel that they are rarely heard in the way that they're heard by their wellness coach. People seldom have the undivided attention of really anyone without judgment. Open-ended inquiry is the use of good questions to enable your client to open up and to tell their story. It's important to ask open-ended questions. Open-ended questions, as they are defined, require long narrative answers whereby closed-ended questions require short answers and are less useful in coaching. Reflections are a form of listening, but in reverse, as they enable the client to hear what they're saying from the vantage point of the coach. This process is often more profound for clients than just asking questions because it causes clients to connect more deeply to their emotions and their truths. When coaches reflect back what they think clients are saying, Clients are more likely to respond with emotions, whereas when coaches ask good open-ended questions, clients will objectively think about and formulate an answer before they respond. Wellness coaches normally come into the profession of coaching with a specialty. Required degrees and certifications from organizations are sometimes not enough, as we know what clients are typically looking for in their coach. You should also expect that clients will want to inquire about your education, your experience level, and some of the positive outcomes that you've seen with other clients. This information will build your client's confidence level and your abilities. A high level of professionalism in your appearance and your demeanor is required, as is demonstrating a passion for what you do as a coach and living well. Coaches have to know their key strengths, and you have to be able to express them to a client without seeming arrogant or judgmental. It is great to be able to rely on science to provide coaches with information. In more recent times, we're starting to gather more statistics that show the effectiveness of coaching and corporate wellness coaching. And maybe the best lesson that we've learned from the corporate wellness field is how wellness can work in groups. Now, when we present information and statistics on behavior change for people who might live with disease, we are, in that way, grouping people together. These groups or populations tend to show trends toward risky behaviors. Lifestyle factors are identified as risky if they tend to lead to chronic stages of disease. For most of the working class, our lifestyle is sometimes defined by what we do for a living because we spend so many hours on the job, so a large part of our lifestyle is our work. For some risk factors, situations arising from employment can directly impact our wellness, and this could involve levels of stress from work demands, sleep issues with shift workers, substance abuse for high-stress positions, and, of course, injuries on the job. 
Through corporate wellness coaching, we've learned that basically most wellness concerns are pretty basically the same across the board, but what's different is how they affect your client and how you coach your client towards successful behavior change. The dynamics of a group mentality towards a wellness coach can get pretty complicated, especially in corporate environments. You will see that some people who are very interested in your program will interact with you really easily, whereas others will be on the opposite end of the scale and maybe in some form of denial about their health and their wellness strategies that they're currently using and maybe not working so well for them. But to be able to accommodate all types in this setting is really vital and might include the use of what we call icebreakers or other creative programs and types of initiating contact for those who are what we call ambivalent. So we have to separate wellness coaching from corporate wellness coaching because corporate wellness coaching is a completely different style of coaching and involves a much larger business component as you would market and promote yourself in a different way if you were doing one-on-one -on -one coaching. So you would then be looking to determine certain delivery models for your site perhaps, or assessing your worksite population, and maybe coordinating logistics of your program delivery, and working with management to facilitate and support all of your different coaching initiatives and your presence on site. The wellness coach who can be deployed out into the field where employees perform their jobs is in both a very unique and fortunate position. This might include working in a warehouse with shift workers or transportation employees who make deliveries sales personnel in the office, or really any job where an employee is at risk for either an injury to occur or for their wellness to be compromised just by the nature of their job description, like being in a high-stress environment. One of the main challenges seen in the wellness coaching profession in corporate settings can be traced back to issues of confidentiality and a fear of mistrust almost among workers who have nothing really against you per se, but an axe to grind with their employer. The wellness coach is stuck in this type of situation. But still, confidentiality is key as a wellness coach, as you are a health professional, and in the United States, you would be considered bound by HIPAA laws to protect the client's personal medical information. Confidentiality matters to an employee in a major way, and in a corporate setting, if you were to repeat any part of a consult to a third party, not only would it be unethical or possibly illegal, depending on local laws, but the employee affected is more likely to shut down and not benefit from interactions because they no longer feel comfortable being open with you. So if this happens, you have a very real problem on your hands, as in a group setting, people will talk and word might spread quickly that confidentiality is not honored. So always respect your client's confidentiality, regardless of anything else. Your certified wellness coach manual references some of the International Coaching Federation guidelines or competencies for coaches. So you need to be able to evaluate your skills and your key strengths. And this is done by self-assessment. There are five main values that are really important for coaches to be able to know about themselves before they can be expected to coach others and understand their values. And once you know more about yourself, by clarifying your own values, you may find that your coaching strategies arise from thinking with more clarity. Essentially, what we're trying to accomplish is for the coach to learn what their strengths are and to be able to sort through all of the clutter and spend more time improving coaching skills. Coaching isn't something you become good at quickly, and becoming a high-quality coach takes months or even years of training and practice. Learning and growth for coaches never stops, just as it is for clients, it's a lifelong journey. With the profession being kind of new, most people don't know what coaching is, so marketing is an important aspect of a successful coaching practice. Some trainers jump on the bandwagon thinking that this is an easy way to bring in another income source or revenue stream, but this is difficult because you'd be trying to sell a product that people don't understand and they can't really see. At the same time, because the field is young, you can become a pioneer and get in on the ground floor. In fact, there's a parallel between coaching and the early days of personal training, when the general public still needed to become familiar with personal training. Now, everyone would like to be working with a trainer, 
but it wasn't always that way. And wellness coaching seems to be following a really similar pathway. So there are a few different career options for a wellness coach. Do you want to be self-employed or do you want to be an employee of a corporation or a company? You might find that you want to do both and that's certainly possible if you can manage all of the logistics involved. Other factors that may help you to decide what career path to take with wellness coaching training include how much time you have to be able to devote or dedicate to being a wellness coach or to cultivate a new client base. If you are already entrenched in a career, you may want to only do wellness coaching on a part-time basis. So regardless of your decision for how much you want to do or how you want to do it, make sure that the choice you make doesn't create any undue stress for you as the coach. The benefits of being an employee should be obvious but could come with more stress. On the other hand, being your own boss means that you can determine your own work environment, your own pay, your own business models, and everything else related to being in business for yourself. Some coaches feel it's safer to be employed by another agency as it provides some job security and, of course, the fact that a client base is typically provided for you as in corporate wellness coaching environments. In our next lesson, we'll talk more about coach fundamentals.